For tradition, competition, beauty, endurance, and so much more, few ocean races can compare to the Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. I think the Sydney Hobart is just, uh, you know, it's the, the ultimate test of uh, team and man and machine and weather, and it's a fantastic event. It's a challenge every time and always different, so uh, this time we built a bigger boat and having a go at line on us. I'd like to win it and uh, to do that you've got to just prepare yourself and, and work towards that goal. For the 59th year, the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia at Rushcutters Bay hosts and officiates the Sydney Hobart. This year, attracting 57 yachts of all varying lengths and designs. For many of the race's competitors and their families, the festive days leading up to the Boxing Day start provide a chance to relax and reminisce. The owner of Scandia, the pre-race favourite for line honours, however, has other things on his mind. Two days before the start and Grant Warrington is 500 miles away from Sydney at the Mornington Yacht Club near Melbourne. He's here to focus all his attention on the race away from the crowds and the hype at the CYCA. For the Australian, this is where his love of sailing began. Well, about uh, three, I think I was, the age of three, just over on that beach over there called Mills Beach. Had a little sabo. My dad used to put me in it and row it round and paddle out between all the sandbanks. And uh, I think when I got to six, he said, right, oh, it's time to uh, stick the mast in and sheet on, you know. So he pushed me off the beach and I just kept out going on a straight line out past the end of the pier and didn't know how to turn around, you know. <laughs> From a six-foot dinghy to a 98-foot super maxi. After coming in second, third and fourth places, Warrington is going all out this year. Scandia is the largest ocean racing yacht ever built in Australia. At the cutting edge of design, engineering and carbon fibre construction, the yacht's secret weapon is her canting keel, which can swing to windward to give more stability and stronger conditions. Unsurprisingly, it's not nine to five work. There's about 30,000 man hours in actually boat building tasks to actually build a boat of this scale. And there's at least another 10,000 man hours in design and management and things that I do, things the designer does and structural engineering and, uh, and really putting the whole package together. It's just a matter of focusing on the project and saying, right, this is where we're going, this is our time frame. This is our budget and uh, try to make it all work. The hardest thing that I've ever had to try to achieve is to try to blend a team where the team has an understanding that team has got to be greater than the individual. 
We've all got egos within the group. We've all got aims and Warrington is also trying a different tack on board. He's asked successful Australian rules football coach Terry Wallace to give a motivational speech to him and his crew. This is one innovative and determined yachtsman. Yes, you've got to do your job, but your job's got to interlink in with every other job that's going on within the structure of your group. I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah, I could be obsessed with winning the race. Uh, look, I suppose, uh, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again, I'll just keep turning up until we win and hopefully we won't have to be so possessed by it next year. We'll just be coming back to have another good year and uh, win the race again. If Warrington thought his maxi would be the largest yacht ever to compete in the race, then New Zealand owner Stuart Thwaites had other plans. His yacht, Zana, is built to exactly the same length but unlike Scandia, has a fixed keel and water ballast, which, due to race rules, cannot be used. Accordingly, Thwaites is playing the rivalry down. Scandia's got lots of advantages over us, and I don't think we've got any over them. They've got a canting keel, electric winches, a slightly shorter rig. I think we've got a bit more sail area than our spinnakers, so uh, they're the favourites. And, uh, Yep, so we're here to do our best as the underdog. We've tended to focus on what we're doing ourselves and uh, it's just nice to have a, uh, another 30 metre boat that hasn't done the um, Hobart before to compete against. The fleet starts the gruelling 628 nautical mile race in Sydney Harbour before heading down the New South Wales coast. From there, they have to cross the formidable Bass Strait. Once negotiated, they follow the east coast of Tasmania before rounding Tasman Island and racing to the finish off Hobart. At the CYCA on the morning of the race, Warrington has finally arrived to face the crowds, his competition and the hype. For all the crews, a chance for last-minute preparations and last goodbyes until Hobart. In Sydney Harbour, hundreds of thousands of spectators on land and water try to get as close to the action as they can. This race is one of Australia's great sporting occasions. But that's the last thing on Warrington and Thwaites' minds. A 12 to 15 knot southeasterly breeze at the start is expected to swing to the southwest offshore, creating tough conditions and a very tactical race. One p.m. and the 59th Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race is off. While most yachts set spinnakers, Scandia and Zana stick with double headsails as they close reach to the first rounding mark. While Scandia takes the advantage over Zana, Grundig AAPT takes the lead. It's a great start for the Open 66. That is, until her spinnaker gets caught on the spreaders. Momentum is lost. In one of the fastest ever starts to a Sydney Hobart, Scandia passes Sydney Heads in the lead, with Zana right on her stern. The fight for IMS handicap and overall winner, where several factors including yacht length, sail area and crew limit are taken into account, is just as competitive. Pre-race favourite Yendis trails rival Ichiban to suggest the race for the Tattersall's Cup could be as wide open as ever. Two days before the start and Grundig's owner is hard at work. Last year, 
Sean Langman beat a lot of larger yachts with a lot larger racing budgets to come second in the race for line honours. Never satisfied, the Australian is doing all he can to move up a place this year. Well, we decided three weeks ago that we weren't quick enough. We went sailing against Scandia and found that she was just a little bit quicker than us. So we went back to the drawing board. We had the lifting rudder idea in the back of our mind. We've been developing it for months. We left on the back burner because we thought we actually had enough boat speed, but we looked at ourselves in the mirror and decided we weren't. So we spent the last week, 12 guys, 20 hours a day, cutting and shutting the boat. We reduced the crew from last year's race from 11 to 8. We chose the most fit, athletic, small crew that we could put on the boat. I reduced my personal weight from 82 kilos to 69 kilos. And uh, I figured about 72 was going to be right, but I think maybe the stress of the last week's taken the last three off me. But is Langman jealous of his well-heeled, well-keeled rivals? It's funny about being envious of, of someone, like I, I'm someone that I admire people that are successful and I admire people that uh, look at a problem and, and, and work with what they've got. The two uh, major boats that we're racing against, they're, they're built maximum rating, maximum length boats and if we had the resources we would probably do the same. However, no, I'm not envious, I want to beat them, but uh, I just think it, it'll be a good contest. Few countries in the world are so linked to the sea as Australia. Over 80% of its population live near its vast coastline. The trip down the New South Wales coastal roads can be just as spectacular as the competition out at the Tasman Sea. Three hours into the race and in attacking duel offshore, Zana has gone ahead of Scandia. I sort of set the groundwork for uh, what I want to achieve and then let other people who have better schools in different areas uh, take it from there. After her problems earlier, Grundig has decided to take a much more direct route south than Zana and Scandia, but remains off the pace. Later the same day, Langman's decision to stay inshore of her rivals has paid off incredibly as Grundig takes the lead. It's like the Everest of, of yachting, you've got, to, you've got to get to the top, you've got to make it there and also you want to get a good result. In these upwind conditions, a downwind flyer such as Grundig wasn't expected to keep up with Zana and Scandia. But then yacht racing can be full of surprises. As the weather and the landscape change, so too does the race. Scandia has pushed hard through the night and by 10 a.m. the next day is ahead of Zana. Grundig is back in third after she hit a sunfish, causing rudder problems. It's the kind of course that anything can happen, you know, conditions can change so rapidly. I think you are always got to consider the other boats and put yourself between them and the finish line. Three hundred miles south of Sydney is the small town of Eden. Its radio relay centre is a vital part of the Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race. At set times, each yacht must report their coordinates via radio to help organisers track positions, but more importantly, to help know that yachts are safe. These skeds, as they are called, are essential listening. This is the radio relay vessel Four Seasons calling all yachts in the Rolex City to Hobart yacht race.
In the race for IMS handicap and overall honors, the 10.30 a.m. skate positions the day after the start has placed AFR Midnight Rambler in the lead, followed by First National Real Estate and Yendis. By early afternoon, the leaders for line honors are sailing hard across Bass Strait, a stretch of water that can be any yacht's undoing, no matter how big. Despite a close encounter with another sunfish, Scandia remains out in front, leading Zana by just a mile. Grundig has slipped back, falling 10 miles behind the two. In these tough, upwind conditions, this is where a yachtsman's love of his sport and the race comes to the fore. Those days come along and you just think, oh, why? <laughs> But uh, look, that's, that's one of the things, it's, it's like some days you're out there and you're bashing up wind and it's blowing 40 knots on the nose and it's wet, cold and miserable. But uh, I suppose those days just go and the middle of the Sydney to Hobart race is just, it's like sometimes you wish you weren't there. But the end, getting around Tasman Island and seeing the spectacular hills and the whole surroundings and the reception you get in Hobart at the end of the race, it just makes it all so worthwhile when you're finished. Bass Strait has managed to claim at least one casualty. The maxi yacht Nicorette, at the time lying fourth, retires from the race and heads back to Eden, having suffered damage to her new canting keel and hull in rough conditions in the strait. It seems new technology has its rewards and risks. For boats like ours, it's a year of preparation, um, a number of months of crew training. Uh, big sacrifices, both you know, financial and time and, and, and energy. So getting halfway across the Bass Strait and being in a fairly good position is always uh, disappointing. But, but that's sport, you know, you take one day at a time. And it's at the end of the day, it's just a game. So I'm not prepared to risk uh, the lives of my crew just for uh, for the sake of a yacht race. You know, it's not worth it. Hi there. Nice to come back to Eden. I've been here once before and well received and quite a spectacular place to come into when you when you feel down, you know. Makes you feel a lot better. While the leading yachts spend the night and the next day sailing hard down the Tasmanian coast, at Constitution Dock in Hobart, the fun has already begun. For one week over the new year, the city transforms itself from the quiet capital of Tasmania into a festival for all the family. No wonder the yachts of the Sydney Hobart race to get done here. Just before dawn on the third day, and the leaders close in on the finish. Despite the best efforts of Thwaites and Zana, Warrington and Scandia have stayed out in front. She wins in a time of two days, 15 hours and 14 minutes, beating Zana by just 14 minutes on elapsed time. After 15 attempts, Warrington has finally won the Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race. Houses have been sold, millions have been spent, and his children have lost sleep. Sorry to get you up so early, buddy. <laughs> But his wife doesn't seem to mind. Oh, it was just super close. So we could see them the whole way from start to finish, with the exception of about 30 minutes this morning. They tacked off, uh, went inshore for a while, and then went came back, and we could see them again. We had a really nice little gain on them. So. We just stayed between them and the finish line after that. The guys just did a sensational job. The boats are so similar in all sorts of conditions. We just found that they were uh, the same speed as us, a little faster maybe in some, and we were faster in others. And 
Just very, very similar, really exciting racing. While Warrington and his crew enjoy the spoils of victory, Zana comes to dock. Sailing over 600 miles to come so close can be tough to take. But Thwaites is ever the professional. We uh, got sick of looking at the back of them because uh, generally we were second. And uh, so, um, yeah, it was, it was fun for a bit when we were in when we were in front, but uh, yeah, it wasn't to be. At the end of the day, you um, have to realise that that's just part of uh, yacht racing, you know, you win and you lose. I'll be back. That was my fourth, I'll be back for a fifth. Just over five hours after Scandia comes Grondig. For Langman and his downwind flyer, the conditions he needed to compete against his bigger rivals never really came. I don't think there's much more we could have done, you know, we, we sailed 600 miles upwind against 98 foot boats and, you know, our, our four days downwind sailing, we optimised the boat for downwind sailing this year, put everything into it, like a quarter million dollars into making the boat go faster downwind and we sailed 30 miles downwind, so we've got two brand new spinnakers sitting down there that haven't been out of the bag yet. So, you know, really we did all that we could do this year and, uh, you know, I, I think it's still... It astonishes me, and I suppose it astonishes a lot of people how we can hang on upwind with this boat for something that's meant to be a downwind flyer. Our performance is generally something for the dreamers and the believers, you know. It's, um, you know, you've got to believe in, in what you can do and you've got to go for it. It's something you aspire to and I think we'll keep going until we win the thing. The remaining yachts in the fleet race to Hobart. In the contest for overall race winner, no one can afford to slow down. Handicap ratings mean that it's possible for a yacht that finishes with a slower time than another yacht to still win once their times are corrected. At 5.32 a.m. on the fourth morning of the race, First National Real Estate arrives in Hobart and is declared overall winner. Owner Michael Spees, who in 1999 co-skippered the Volvo 60 Nokia to a record-breaking line honours victory, proves he can also win in an everyday yacht. First National Real Estate is a Beneteau 40.7, the hugely popular far design that has sold some 500 boats worldwide. For Spees, winning the Tattersall's Cup in what is regarded, although modified, as a cruising yacht against so many out-and-out -out racers makes victory even sweeter. I'm passionate about this race. It's my 27th time I've done it. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a big part of my life. Um, and you see the trends change, and we've raced line on us for a few times, but I, I think it's, it is good for the racing as much as that all the people on my boat, my crew, my team there, um, it, most of them just have normal jobs, nine to five, small businesses, and we did it on quite a modest budget. As for Warrington, victory next year in the historic 60th Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race is already being planned. But for now, he can take in the new year with his children at the dockside. It looks as if it's all been worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs>